Hello and welcome to Sex, Psychics and Psychedelics, Discovering Inner Liberation. My name is Banana Jane Garnett. I'm a licensed psychotherapist, a lover of freedom and a relentless explorer of the mind. Please come join me on my journey in hot pursuit of inner illumination and liberation. For more about me, you can find me at The Banana Jane on Instagram. Now let's dive in. Today I speak with Harvard-trained psychiatrist Dr. Will Sue about ketamine-assisted psychotherapy as well as Will's journey into the leading edges of the psychedelic renaissance. Welcome, Will. I'd, I'd love to hear more about your journey, actually. Um, I like meeting psychiatrists who are actually healers and because um, it, it's not sort of the, not the image that I I grew up with. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear how you came into this line of work and how your interests have grown. Sure. I, um, yes, I, let's see, I'm 41 now and at um, 30, 31, I was starting my psychiatry residency at Harvard. And um, at that time, I did not have long hair, no piercings, no jewelry. Um, you know, I was very, very much in the medical establishment. I was raised Jehovah's Witness. I was... Oh. Never, I'd not touched any drugs other than I'd smoked pot like five times in my life by the age of like 31. And they gave me panic attacks. I ended up in the hospital a few times. Oh, poor thing. Yeah. I was having a heart attack. So, I mean, I was very much not, you know, into psychedelics. I thought they were dangerous. I thought they were addictive. Um, but long story short, after my first year at, uh, as an intern, a medical intern, I just, you know, I got into my psychiatry training finally. And, um, I really started realizing that our, you know, our, our, our medications didn't work, you know, antidepressants work at best about one third of the time. And that's like our best established treatment. Right. And so placebo works about 20% of the time. And I remember like we had one particular lecture where that was described again, antidepressants work one third of the time. Placebo works 20% of the time. Wow. And it really, yeah. I'm like, I, I think by that time I had been, in school for 14 straight years after high school because I got, I also got a PhD and I was, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, I did all of this for 10% better than placebo. I mean, I was just, I was rocked and uh, I went into a depressive state. I was suicidal and I, you know, I wasn't even able to get much relief. I tried antidepressants. They made me feel worse. I finally got into psychotherapy, which started helping. Um, but that was, how old were you then? 33. Mm. And then by chance, as I was going through this sort of um, life crisis about what, you know, what should I do with my life? I had applied to management consulting firms. I thought about dropping out and going and getting my MBA. Um, anyway, but at, at that same time, as I go, I'm going through this, my childhood best friend, he, um, he started trying psychedelics for the first time. So he, uh, that, that, I won't tell his full story, but it just happened to be that he was going through this as I was going through my own process and it just, they, they synergized. And I finally looked up that, you know, there was a lot of research being done in psychiatry in the fifties and sixties with psychedelics. It was very yeah. prominent and that they weren't dangerous and addictive. Really. It was a, it was a government sort of um, propaganda that really said that these were, shouldn't be used. And so, um, and then just lots of synchronicities since then, um, you know, so I, did you start trying psychedelics with your with your childhood best friend, or how? The first time I, I tried a psychedelic, yeah. Yeah. and um, just again synchronicities, and then I Rick, Rick Doblin, who started Maps, which is the nonprofit mm -hmm. that is um, funding the MDMA research and administering it. He he happened to live two blocks from the hospital that I was working at. You know, it was just like synchronicity after mm. synchronicity. The first person in the psychedelic community that I met. And just because he, at that time it was like him and I in Boston, this is like 2012. Like there was no, like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. It was happening. And then, so I just, yeah, he introduced me to a bunch of people and I got into the maps training and really it just was life changing ever since then. Mm, it must've been amazing going into the maps training. How was that? Yeah, it was very beautiful. Yeah. I, mm. I, went to my, it, it used to be different. There was like two or three parts to it. So yeah, my first one is in 2014 and then I did, did a couple since then. So yeah, it's, it's been very special. And 
you know, a, a really helpful part of that also was that um, there's a program for the therapists that, that have been trained to actually take MDMA themselves um, in a, a legal format. So then it gives us the experience of what it's like to take MDMA. It also allows us to, you know, speak about our MDMA use and our experience with it, you know, without saying, oh, I, I you know, had to buy this on the street and do it mm-hmm. Mm. Was that the game changer for you? Was it MDMA? Was it the journey? What was what was the thing that really shifted you from a place that was so sort of disappointed? Um, I, I mean, I don't know if there was one thing, but if I had to put my finger on one, it would actually be my first psychedelic experience. So I, I smoked DMT. That was my first. Um, oh, wow. You went straight into something uh, quite hardcore, huh? Well, Yes and no. I mean, the way I think about it, so I was terrified to take a psychedelic. And mm-hmm. so to me, it was like described as one that only lasts like 10 minutes. So uh, I was like, oh, right. but I can handle anything for 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, no one, I didn't really know that time kind of sort of really ceases to exist for five or 10 minutes also. And so it felt much longer than that. But yeah. It's powerful enough and it removed enough of the illusions and the veils to, to help me see that there was something much, much bigger at play. And I think it opened back up uh, sort of my spirituality. You know, I considered myself an atheist uh, after leaving the Jehovah's Witness Church um, mm. up until that up until that moment of smoking DMT. Um, I would, would have said there is no God. There is no bigger purpose. This is all just, um, you know, molecules that happen to you know, turn into beings and stuff, but but yeah. Within ten minutes, uh, I, I was pretty sure that's not the case. <laughs> so that that was probably a very a very crucial experience. Right. So since then, you just had more faith. Would you say? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's only yeah. 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 For you, given that you're in in a way, you're in this sort of rare intersection right now. Um, although I guess you know, with with legality increasing, that that won't always be the case, but you um you know you can legally prescribe ketamine and um host ketamine experiences is that right can you let's actually get into the nuts and bolts of yeah, this so actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah so basically tell me your yeah tell me what your sort of job description is and the work that you've been doing with with ketamine sure so um yeah i'm a i'm a psychiatrist in training not sorry not in training by training <laughs> <laughs> yeah freud in slip right we're all in training yeah yeah in a way, sure. um, yeah yeah so i I'm, i live in southern california and los angeles and i have a private practice um and yeah i i see people for healing work um i actually won't start off by saying ketamine because I, I don't think of myself that's not really what i identify as you know um, okay sure yeah yeah, and I, but I practice very different from most psychiatrists. I see people, everyone I see, I see weekly for therapy. Um, most of the people that I see are not on any medications. I have not prescribed an antidepressant since 2015. Um, and yeah, so, so these days, I, you know, some of my work you know, involves people you know, wanting help preparing for psychedelic experiences or, or helping to integrate um, uh, experiences that they have had. Um, yeah. And then sometimes I, I do provide ketamine, uh, treatments for people when it's in the sort of, uh, in the process of, uh, you know, an established, uh, therapy relationship with myself. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of part of my work. And also, uh, I'm very interested in psychedelic therapy for non psychiatric issues. So, for more what what, are, what are, would classically be um, categorized as medical issues. So, I'm, I'm prepping a study right now for MDMA for fibromyalgia. Um, oh. you know, I think psychedelics have a lot of potential for treating you know autoimmune illnesses and anything where we think of like stress makes it worse. I think oh, of oh, that's so I'm so fascinated by that because I never would have. Uh, pegged MDMA in that I, I, for me MDMA was always sort of it was in the category of like could be really helpful for couples can be a truth serum can be yeah a great reliever of of um, stress obviously can you know can ignite sort of pleasure and connection um, but I always actually felt like oh it's a bit chemical and probably is a bit rough on the system and very interested to think it might might help the the body can you tell me more about that 
Yeah, I mean, I think sort of anywhere where we think of as, you know, stress being a contributing factor. And so in, in medicine, kind of the first really, I think, well-established, again, medical illness that we thought of as being related to stress is, is heart disease. And this is from like studies from years and years back where people are like, oh, like um, cardiovascular illness, heart attacks, strokes are worse with stress, which makes sense to most everyone, but it took time for the medical establishment to actually show that that, that makes things worse. And then you get Oh, like, you know, is it cortisol? Is it, um, you know, different inflammatory factors, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. That makes sense. But what's really, is that, is that really the source or is it the emotional, um, uh, difficulties, the people not living their lives the way they really want to be living. Right. And, and that ends up being the source of the stress hormones, if we want to call it that, and then leading to inflammation, causing problems with the cardiovascular mm -hmm. system immunity, et cetera, or chronic pain. And so, um, yeah, so I think that's why I think, you know, psychedelics have a massive potential, not just for mental illness, but for physical illness. I think it, you know, it could potentially be the staple treatment for, for most everything. I, I don't want to come off as saying that. I think also they're a panacea. I think it'll take some time to, to, to establish, but I, I do think it has massive potential for, for most, um, human suffering. Mm, mm, yeah, no, I absolutely I agree with you. And I think we're sort of in this strange phase of this kind of explosion of yeah, of information and expectation. And uh, you can't make omelets without breaking eggs, and there are going to be eggs broken in this in this process. Um, I get the sense that you're you're less interested in ketamine. But I, I mean, I had wanted to, we don't have to do this, but I had wanted to kind of um, get a map with you of the different kind of ways of, of working with ketamine. I think mainly because I've been very interested in its role in this movement in the sense that it's, well, it's been kind of the, the most sort of legalized, the most integrated into the existing sort of like uh, established um, medical system. And it seems like there's such a range of applications. And it also seems like there's a lot of potential for abuse. I feel like I'm hearing at least anecdotally of more um, recreational addiction to to ketamine. And I don't want to pathologize that, but it's just one of the things that's kind of on my on my mind in this picture. Um, so yeah, I don't know if if you'd want to kind of talk more about the the different applications of ketamine and and what you think the leading edge is and what you think the the issues yeah. might be also. And, and I, I don't want to say that I, I'm less or I'm not interested in ketamine. You know, mm -hmm. I. It has its role, and I think the different psychedelics, you know, I think what we're going to, what's being started to at least be talked about is that they're not all created equal, you know, because everyone's talking about psychedelic, psychedelic, psychedelic therapy, but, but it's an umbrella term for a very diverse group of medicines that have very different uh, effects on people, right? It could be either the amount of time that it's present I think of the departure from this consensus reality. So how, how deep it, it sort of pulls away the filters and the illusions that we're living in. Um, the speed at which it does that, say like smoked DMT versus ayahuasca or even San Pedro, you know? Does right, it right. Like you're talking about like a 10 minute experience compared to a, a weekend experience or an overnight experience, yeah. So, so the thing is, ketamine has its role within that. You know, I think for people that have really, like, what, what most psychiatrists would call, say, uh, a major, that are in a major depressive episode, and we can, I don't love diagnoses, but for convention, I'll use that. Yeah. But have trouble getting out of bed, you know, are not showering every day, are not shaving every day, really deep depression. Ketamine, I think, is better than any of the other ones, actually. Mm -hmm. um, especially when used in an injectable form. I was going to say that would that that would be the intramuscular or intravenous. I, or either, intravenous. I like using intramuscular, but most of the research studies and most of the ketamine in clinics yeah. is IV. So okay. I, is that the one? Because I ask, I go and see a neurologist. I've had headaches um, pretty consistently throughout my life. And I thought maybe I should do uh, have, you know, a series of ketamine treatments. I didn't end up 
end up doing it because my neurologist told me that to receive the ketamine or not only, I mean, the price was insane as well, but, um, I was going to have to go under, they were going to have to put me under anesthetic. She said, because I said, well, I- I'm fine having the psychedelic experience. I'm kind of used to it. And, uh, and she was like, no, trust me, you don't want to have this experience. We would put you fully under. And I thought, oh, that seems like such a heavy combo. So I was. And I don't even know if that would work very well if, if you do remove the, the subjective experience from it. But um, so what I was, was mentioning is that so, so for people who are in, in the vast majority of the evidence that's published on ketamine is for depression. And for that, it works very, I would say it works very well in about one third of people and about a third of people, it's like night and day. It's like, I, you know, even people who have been depressed for months or years, like, like it, I, I kind of think about it like an electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That yeah. Reset the computer. Like, you know, your phone. System. Acting up. It's just like a let's restart. And does that, does that last or is that a stupid and question? A, and about a third of people, it works yeah. great with a third yeah. of people have depression and another third kind of works okay mm-hmm. and a third of depressed people it like does nothing mm-hmm. and then though you, you a lot what what some of the issues that's been coming up with sort of more of the there's more like pop-up clinics especially in 2020 with like the ability to for physicians to prescribe without seeing people in person because of covid there's been a lot of startups that came out that say oh we're going to prescribe you either nasal ketamine or oral ketamine at home and those, there's just no data behind, or very little data for any of that. And so then, and then you've got all this advertising on social media and other places where people are like, oh, well, this helps PTSD and it helps OCD and it helps all this other stuff that like, they're just, it's just not true. Like, you know, it, it might be, but there's not an established mm-hmm. thing behind it. So that's where as a practitioner right now, you know, we were talking about feeling a little overwhelmed or burnt out is like the number of emails that's just like, how much is a ketamine session? I want a ketamine set. It's like, <laughs> I, I don't have the energy to go and be like, well, to explain basically what I'm explaining to you and be like, this is part of a long-term treatment thing. And it's just, it, it's getting a bit. It, it, it's, mm, it sounds like you've got a lot of hungry mouths coming at you. Yeah. So yeah. I sort of just wait until, you know, I, I work with people if they want to just work regularly as, as, a, as a patient of mine without the expectation of ketamine. And then if it makes sense, then we do ketamine. Um, you know, but otherwise it's just, it's, it's just so much out there to, to have to clarify as a practitioner that I am not able to do right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that's to say, I think ketamine has a beautiful role. It's powerful, um, in a, in a select group of people. Right. So it's really, yeah. So you're really saying that the the focus right now is, is on, uh, treating depression, sort of, um, treatment resistant depression, chronic depression, um, what's, what about pain? What do you think about ketamine for pain? I think ketamine can also be helpful for pain as well. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm working, I'm, a, uh, I'm on the board of advisors for a company named Bexon, which is, has, uh, we're developing a subcutaneous pump, um, to, to put in low amounts of, of ketamine. So it's kind of like a mobile IV. And so that's going to be, we're not targeting mental health right now. We're targeting chronic pain. So potentially, you know, making a, a big, um, you know, providing a big opportunity for people that are addicted to opiates, right? Because that's really the, the only sort of long-term. Uh, mm. So is, do you think ketamine is preferable to opiates for pain? And if so, why? I mean, that, that, that's a hard, I, I mean, it depends, right? If we, if you have an acute pain, like I just had a tooth pulled a couple of weeks ago, you know, opiates have a really good role there. Yeah. I mean, the issue comes with long-term use or then the addiction um, to, to opiates. And so that's, that's an area that's much more difficult. Or another area where ketamine can be interesting is in acute pain. So we have a, a grant potentially that's going to get funded by the military. So say if someone gets injured out in the field, mm. um, can you, provide a quick uh, injection or a subcutaneous pump treatment for ketamine. And yeah. so, you know, potentially that could even uh, help alter some of the, the PTSD. If you get someone mm. who uh, there was a shock against their life and in the moment you're relieving the, the physical pain, but also, you know, helping them not, not, not be so aware of the pain until they get, you know, treatment or get to a hospital or something. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It doesn't you know, feel like a numbing thing. It feels more like a sort of, 
um, a supporting. It's not, it doesn't, yeah. yeah, it doesn't feel like, I mean, I think the sort of ketamine opiate is a, are numbing, aren't they? Yeah. So ketamine is a, it's a, it's a dissociative anesthetic, right? So it means like the mind and body at high doses are completely disconnected. So meaning, and, and there's a gradient in between the two, right? From, from very light experiences to full dissociation. So you can inject a person, right? Ketamine was really a, it was and is an, an anesthetic before it was a mental health treatment. And so I remember can, we grew up thinking it was horse tranquilizer and I had friends at university who would take tons of it and sit in chairs well, going into chaos. Well, it is horse yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, yeah. Is, it is available as an anesthetic to humans and animals. Right. And mm -hmm. it's a very, it's probably one of the best and it's the cheapest. Um, so meaning as, as you dissociate the mind from the body, you're not going to feel pain because you know, those signals are just not getting to the brain. And so, but if you can get it sort of in a sweet spot where it's like low enough to where people can still function and go to work or go to school, but get their pain down significantly. But that takes, you know, a very precise dosing, which is what we're targeting with the subcutaneous pump. In theory, you could have that also with an IV, but you know you can't walk around with an IV mm -hmm. bag, and have a doctor with you all the time. So this is kind of one of the solutions. I mean, uh, but you know, some people are also looking at you know what if you get a weekly treatment or you know twice a month treatment with ketamine? Can that help pain or depression or anxiety? There's another area there that I think there, that ketamine can be very helpful. Um, so so that's sort of somewhere in between the the lozenges and the full treatment, the full sort of IV treatment, it's a lighter. Um, I, I would say it's more like an IV treatment. I mean, it can, you know, uh, ketamine, I'm, it's interesting that I didn't plan on really even talking about this ketamine pump, but it's, it's, um, it's a way of establishing like a, a consistent blood level of ketamine without the ups and downs of oral or nasal. Right. Because, right, because the oral uh, uh, produces nausea, right? Which I is, mean, this is well. like many side effects, but the yeah. thing, if it's nasal or it's oral, you sort of have the absorption. It takes time to absorb. The, the amount goes up in the blood and then it goes down. So you have kind of these like up and down um, mm. sort of levels of, of, of ketamine in the blood. That's true for any medication that you take orally or in the, or in the nose. Mm -hmm. And so if you have something that can go directly into the blood like IV or a subcutaneous pump, you can kind of maintain just a, a, uh, a steady mm -hmm. level. You can turn it off at any moment. Um, and so ketamine is going to, I think, have a, a significant role in, in, in pain in the future. Um, but anyway, yeah. but a little mental health indication is that, you know, it is different than other psychedelics where the hope is with therapy plus MDMA or therapy plus psilocybin, you can have a handful of experiences and it leads to a, you know, relatively permanent um, change in life where ketamine that's not where i've seen ketamine work I, I don't have anyone who has had you know a handful or even 10 ketamine experiences who are like i'm changed for life it still requires some amount of going mm. back in whether is it's that, yeah is that because there's less insight in the in the ketamine experience well, I, I, I happen to think it's more because you don't get the physical catharsis that you get with other psychedelics. Like, like because it's a dissociative, you don't have as much of a physical experience, right? It's, it's actually much less common to, to be crying. I mean, definitely mm -hmm. at the end as it's wearing down, you can have mm -hmm. emotional responses. But you're actually, you know, separating mind and body. Mm -hmm. One of my supervisors, her name is Bella. Um, she's yeah, one of the early MAPS therapists. Got it. So, you know, we had a conversation about this and, and people very accurately say, call MDMA a heart opener. Yes. Where ketamine, her and I, and there's, you know, I think the people who really work with ketamine a lot, you know, she calls it a mind opener, right? The mind stays relatively intact unless you go like deep, deep, high levels of ketamine. You just get a dissociation of the body and the mind. Other psychedelics, you don't get this dissociation. You're feeling things in the body the entire time. So there's a connection. And I think that's the body is where we hold the history of the trauma, which is what usually is causing us suffering in the present day. And so with other psychedelics, you get more of a, a, a catharsis, a movement of the old trauma, the old energy out of the body. And that can lead to very you know, permanent mm -hmm. as I said, mm -hmm. um, yeah. physical symptoms. And ketamine just it doesn't seem to work that way. You know? Yeah. Thank you for that explanation. That That's very helpful, actually. Um, I mean, there's one way that I look at this, which is sort of 
this is more of a kind of zoom out, I suppose, which is that we can, you know, it is very subjective and all sorts of people can have all sorts of different experiences with different um, plants, medicines, drugs. And sometimes what's most helpful is putting something on the map that you've never experienced before. I had an experience with ketamine where for a minute I felt completely sort of I would say pain free. You know, it made me realize that there's always some level of pain that I'm dealing with in my body. And I don't know if that's a sustainable state. I mean, you could just call that being really high. I, when I experienced that, I thought, oh, I would love to do this again. And also, I wouldn't want to rely on this. But I felt like this is a really interesting thing because now I've had this experience of this state, you know, it felt like a sort of physical nirvana. And um, so I don't really know what to do with that information, but I'm glad I had that experience. I'm glad I have that place on the map. It almost feels like, yeah, I've had, and I've had this in different ways with different psychedelics where I've sort of seen my full potential in a certain way. And then I, okay, then after the psychedelic, then I'm back in my default life. And but there's a sense of, oh, I've had this other experience as another place on the map. Like when you go to, you know, India for the first time, whatever, you're like, oh my God, these different worlds exist. Um, and I don't have to stay so confined in my own sort of sense of, of what, what is or isn't possible. Um, so I suppose we can have those new experiences in the mind or in the body or in the heart. Um, and hopefully they become sort of little pointers what direction we need to travel in the way i think about what's kind of the the things that you were describing right now i think Mm. of it if i think of consciousness our awareness right that i am will you are jane right and we we tend to think of our consciousness in concert with the body right and and medicine and neuroscience would say oh our consciousness lies in the brain i don't happen to think that you know, I, I think that it, part of it lies in the brain. Some of it lies in the rest of our body. So again, this dissociation concept with ketamine, it's like if we have mind and body together most of our life, and then we get departure from it, the mind stays intact, the body is where we feel pain, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain, right? When we're in emotional pain, it's like my chest is doing this, my stomach is doing this, or physical pain, obviously, it's like my arm, my leg. But if you can dissociate from it, It provides this experience of, oh, I don't have pain because it separates it. And then we kind of re-enter. And so that then, then we're like, oh shit, I'm back in this like, right? I kind of think of the body as like the spaceship that we have for this journey of life, right? We're we're, we're kind of in it. I was about to say stuck with it, but it's also (laughs) very- (laughs) Yes, sometimes. Yes. It's also where we feel pleasure, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Departure and re-entering, you know, I was talking to um, a, a colleague of mine and he described it this week as it's like the Garden of Eden, right? We, we pull away the physical pain, the emotional pain, whether it's with ketamine or high doses sometimes of other psychedelics. And then we see life in a clear way. Oh, what am I like without these uh, mental reservations about who I am and what I'm capable of? What am I without this physical pain? And then you re-enter it. And then it, it can feel painful again. And people want that thing back. Yeah. yeah. The issue with ketamine, which is unique amongst the other psychedelics, is that it most consistently takes away that pain. It's a dissociative, right? And so that's why you find people that go back. And I don't like to use the word addicted or even abuse. Mm. I think of the word soothing. They're in pain and they want relief from that pain. Same way alcohol works and why, you know, most of, the Western world goes home after a day of work and has a drink or two or more. You got it. Yeah. 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 We're living lives that we don't really want to be living. We're working jobs. We don't want to be mm-hmm. living for seven, eight, ten hours a day. I'm going to drink away that, that, that pain for a little bit. And then I'm going to go to sleep and do it again the next day instead of actually making changes in our life. Right? Yeah. Or by the way, you know, surf the internet shop, bitch to a friend. Sure. Use porn, blah, 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 right? There's so many different crutches. We're, we're, I, again, I like to use the word soothing, right? Because soothing, I mean, yeah. No one wakes up in the morning, right? And, I, you, know, I just, you know, I worked in, a, in substance abuse for years. There's no 
person who's addicted to opiates who wakes up in the day and says, instead of a loving family, instead of a great romantic partnership, I'd really like to go out and buy heroin. <laughs> Nobody does that. Right. You know? and right. The, 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 the storylines outside are these people are bad. They're ad- addicted, but no one, that's the best that people can do at that, at that moment in time, right. Without all the other loving support that, that would be necessary to have a, you know, again, a, a less, much less painful life, um, you know, in community with family. So. Yeah, I completely agree. And actually I like the, the pictures you just put side by side, you know, the split screen of like the little pill and then all of the other things, you know, it's not just one thing. Like you said, are you describing a whole kind of village of, of loving support um, yeah. that, that could, you know, uh, equate to the same level of, of soothing or a whole litany of other experiences or a whole redoing of life? Um, so, yes, I, I really like that, that reframe into, into soothing. Um, so to you, when you look at all of the psychedelics, you don't feel like, you don't feel that there's a danger around ketamine, that it is because it is so soothing and user-friendly and reachable that people will be using it in a way that isn't optimal for them? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've said that at all. Like, uh, so no. I, um, I, I think that of any of the psychedelics, it's the one that consistently soothes. So I do think that there is more potential for overuse or, or, or if, to use the word abuse. Uh, it, it is the one psychedelic. I think that does have that potential. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just part of what that, that is. So, um, and yeah, yeah. And like in the burning man circles and the psychedelic yeah. circle, ketamine is, has been heavily abused, um, for, for decades already. This isn't something new. It's just becoming more. Busy. Yeah. I think I've only, you know, started being more more aware of it to be honest um which is probably showing how old i am you know probably if i was in my 20s it would be a different different scenario but yeah the 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 drugs in fashion keep changing i guess and and what we're looking for um on mass is changing and I, it seems like now we're looking for for help on on a lot of different fronts um but but the psychedelics have a more kind of um you know mystical component as well we're, we're looking for for spiritual experience and alleviation of suffering yeah um and and they can provide both right but it's, yeah. it's the establishment of the change in the rest of our life with our family with our partners with our work with our friends that's going to lead to the established change and those changes don't actually require psychedelics to begin with it usually it's just psychedelics can be an experience that leads people to see potentially mm. that, that needs to be changed. But even then it, it, it can require a lot of help because a lot of the stuff that we're doing is unconscious. And so in a way, this is why, you know, again, I, I, I just don't respond. I, I don't have the energy to respond anymore to people who are like, can I get a ketamine experience? Like, it's just, it's just yeah. like, this is why I see people weekly and I work with people only long-term because the goal is to get them to change their life. And, and that's why I'm able to get people off of their medications. And I haven't prescribed antidepressants because they're making these established changes in their life, but it takes time and it takes support, you know? And I think that that's one area where even say in the, as, as psychedelics become medicalized and used or in, in the underground therapy world, you know, most of the underground therapists that I know only do one, maybe two pre-sessions and post-sessions with their clients. There's no way that that, for the most part, I mean, again, depending what other people's support is like, maybe sometimes that leads to long-term change. But for the most part, one or two sessions before and after, I, I don't see, you know, that that's not the way I, 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 I like to work with people. Mm, so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, so back to your practice, uh, it's clear to me that, you know, you're, you're, um, at a, some kind of a turning point or a need to kind of articulate, you know, what your, um, how you're serving and who you're calling in as clients. Um, can you tell me just what your, what your kind of dream scenario is or the direction you'd like to head the clients that you'd like to call in so that we know you know, what the best fits are going to be for you and how to help? 
Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, yeah clientele, I essentially just take people now that have, from word of mouth because I think, again, um, kind of as I was describing, there's so much um, hype and high expectations of psychedelics that it's it's it, when I take people who are just directly from referrals from other clients or from practitioners that know me very well, it's just the the patients know kind of what they're getting into to begin with, and so. Yeah, I mean, I work with a, a wide range of, of folks. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I really enjoy working with um, creatives or entrepreneurs, um, public figures, because in, in a way, I feel like I'm, I'm working with a pretty low volume of people compared to most uh, clinicians. And so in a way, it's like, you know, a lot of the clients I work with, you know, ha already have like a, a pretty significant impact in the world and if i can help them to connect deeper to their authenticity and to their hearts i, I see their work as then going out and um impacting a large number of people and i mean it's not that that's what i was seeking i mean it's just that you know that's that's the people that are coming to me right now and so um yeah i'm sort of uh, trying to trust more and more that whatever you know i'm, I'm meant to serve and, and do you know spirit will kind of uh bring my way so yeah it seems like that's that's the kind of path that you're on and what are your um sort of greater wishes for uh this world of this world of medicine that you happen to be in um you know it's it's i think you know rick doblin talks about this this goal he had early on when he established maps in 1986 of mass mental health that was always um, on his mind. And I think that's something that I think is, I think access to, um, things that can bring our, expand our consciousness, um, our deeper awareness of, you know, the magnificence of this human experience, I think is, is what would lead to, I think, um, larger scale societal change. Right. And I think that psychedelics for me, appear to be the, the most powerful tool to open um, ourselves to our awareness. Um, and, you know, I don't know, it just, I think just having access, I think is number one for me, because I, I would also love if, you know, we could provide just all clinicians, 100% complete training for them to be really, you know, amazing psychedelic therapists. But I think, you know, I, I it's, you know, I think of sort of society is going to develop along with psychedelics. I don't think of psychedelic therapy as having to be like pushed upon everybody, you know, and I think it will more naturally unfold with how society is meant to unfold, the speed it's meant to unfold if, if we just make it available. Are you okay with that sort of uh, the, the gas pump idea, you know, that we could just uh, fill ourselves up with, with psilocybin on the fly? What do you mean? I mean that with with legalization, there are people wanting to just codify, you know, um, being able to go and buy some psilocybin, just fill yourself up with a psychedelic without um, without therapeutic supervision, without any sort of hand holding either side. Yeah, no, so that I mean, I no, I don't, I don't, I don't happen to think that that's going to be what shifts people um, more consistently than having some sort of um, framework of how to work with these, you know, mm -hmm. but again, I'm not, you know, I, I think people should be free to sort of explore their consciousness as long as they're not sort of harming other people or, or, or harming themselves. I think, yeah. Let, yeah. Let people kind of well, yeah, exactly. It's sort of, it's something that can't really be uh, controlled. It's results may vary and legal or not, everyone's going to get their, get their hands on the things that, that suit them. So, um, well, I, I join you in the, in the prayer for mass mental health. Um, that just sounds like, like music, music to my soul. So, so I'm with you on that journey. Um, and thank you so much for showing up today. I had no idea where our conversation would go and it went to some, some interesting places and, um, yeah, I really appreciate your, your thoughtfulness and uh, originality on this topic.
Speaking with Will reminded me that while we are in a psychedelic renaissance, our understanding of the scope of these medicines is still really in its infancy. When it comes to individuals and psychedelics, results may vary, as I like to say, and it's always worth remembering that mental health and quick fixes tend not to go hand in hand. Lasting change, as Will reinforced, is systemic and usually requires reinforcement 